that was the moment when I had a shift of understanding and I realized that it's not so important uh, to look at the algorithm first. Uh, it's first important to look at the representation. Uh, you wouldn't think this in the beginning, at least I didn't. You actually have to expose yourself because although it costs energy to constantly argue and come up with arguments, but that is, in the end, the best way of refining the structural change that you might have discovered. This is Brain Inspired. Hey, everyone. This is Paul Middlebrooks, back in my home studio. Today, I speak with Francisco de Salsa Weber. He is the founder of Cortical IO, which is a natural language processing startup out of Vienna, Austria. And they process text in a novel way to do all sorts of things with it. I say novel because Francisco developed his technology based on what he believes to be the most reasonable theory on how the cortex processes information. And that is essentially the theory of Jeff Hawkins from episode 17 of this podcast, and I'll refer you to that episode to learn the ins and outs of Jeff's ideas about cortical information processing. But Jeff's uh, hierarchical temporal memory technology takes in and does calculations on long vectors of binary data made up of mostly zeros and a handful of ones. And this is known as a sparse distributed representation. And you'll hear Francisco talk in depth about how the text processing works via his semantic folding theory. As a quick primer here, uh, his system that does this, called Retina, takes in a, a corpus of text about a subject that you're interested in, and it breaks down the text and ends up with words in the form of these long, binary, sparsely populated vectors, which Francisco calls semantic fingerprints. And Words that have similar meanings or are associated with similar concepts have similar semantic fingerprints um, in that they, they physically look similar when you visualize them on little semantic fingerprint plots. So, for example, uh, if you were me in my late high school slash early college days, you might feed it a large body of classic Russian literature, uh, and the retina system would create a Russian literature semantic universe filled with the words from those books. Uh, and you could enter your most beautiful sentence and find out whether you're the next Dostoevsky or the next Tolstoy, or something along those lines. Francisco shares uh, how he came to this current solution for his version of natural language processing and how he was inspired by Jeff Hawkins' work, uh, especially using sparse distributed representations, to represent how brains code information. Uh, we talk about language uh, as an extension of our own brains, or really like an extended growth of our brains, and how the codes in our heads get externalized by us and internalized by someone else, and then coded back into essentially the same code in their brains. He lays out a bit of the history of how people have tried to process language, all the way up to our modern big data deluge why the deep learning approach isn't ideal for many of the applications that are needed to work with language. And we walk through his semantic folding theory and how his system actually processes language data to make it useful for all sorts of tasks uh, and how this kind of processing could compare with how brains do it. Uh, and Francisco shares ideas on how you, dear listener, could start your own business using the principles of semantic folding theory. You can learn more about his business at cortical.io, uh, where you can also play with some of the tools that he's made and that we talk about. I have to apologize for the audio quality in this episode. Because of technical issues, I wasn't able to record with my normal setup. So uh, we had to use some lesser third-party software with lower quality uh, audio. So the sound itself isn't great. Plus, uh, I was working with editing one track between me and him. And given the delay between me in the U.S. and Francisco in Austria, we ended up you know, talking over each other plenty, uh, and there just isn't anything I could do to fix it. Hopefully, you can still enjoy our conversation, despite that limitation and my invariant limitation as myself. 
You can find the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 31. Thank you to Felix, Michael, Sharika, you, and Lee for contributing to the show via Patreon. Uh, when our paths cross, I will buy you a coffee or a beer, and we can talk about brains and machines and how awesome you are for helping me run this show. And thanks for listening, guys. You are a wonderful and curious audience, and I love bringing you excellent people like Francisco to your ears, wherever they may be. And here is Francisco de Salsa Weber. Francisco, thanks for joining me and agreeing to teach me how our brains uh, understand language today. Well, hello. Thanks uh, for having me. And uh, I hope I can actually uh, teach you something. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're, you're the uh, founder of a startup called Cortical.io, Cortical.io. And this is actually your third uh, startup company that you founded. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So I've uh, entered uh, the computer science market, if you want, in the year 2000, um, after having worked uh, uh, in the Vienna General Hospital uh, on uh, natural science. And since then, I have tried to innovate certain sectors. Uh, that seems to be just my way of uh, uh, looking at problems is to try and find a, a different solution and uh, i've worked in the in the um, in the context of open source software so the, mm. this whole concept of collaboratively uh, creating uh, useful stuff was sort of key for me at the time that uh, moved over into uh, what at the time was information retrieval i had a, a second company uh, working on patent analytics and uh, patent search uh, as a specific topic. And that's where I basically learned about the limitation of today's uh, state of the art when it comes to properly interpreting uh, language. Mm. And uh, yeah, that led me to Cortical I.O. in the end. <laughs> yeah, well, so I mean, this is interesting. And, and hopefully later we'll have a few minutes just to talk about uh, founding startups in general, because um, yeah. usually here, we, you know, I'm, I'm talking to neuroscience researchers. And uh, so, so this will be a different, mm -hmm. interesting perspective. So let me see if I can mm -hmm. just summarize uh, what Cortical IO does, and then you can take it from there and uh, correct me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> okay. you guys have an approach to natural language processing that stems from the theories uh, of Jeff Hawkins about how our cortex uh, and the brain processes information. And uh, mm -hmm. the goal is to be able to process you know, massive amounts of text that's being generated all the time uh, and to process it like numbers are processed. So to be able to do computations mm -hmm. with it. And uh, we'll talk about how all that happens uh, in a few minutes, mm -hmm. but then to be able, then you can feed the processed information into the systems um, called uh, hierarchical temporal memory systems made by Jeff Hawkins' team at Numenta. Is that an accurate kind of big picture description? And what, what would you add? Yes, absolutely. So um, the whole thing started, as I've mentioned before, by learning about the limitations of our current way of handling text. And the one thing I've really learned is that improvement uh, happens in fraction of percentage steps in terms of uh, precision for very specific evaluations. So right. we are basically so far away from uh, what we uh, what we humans can do that I said, okay, this is, doesn't look like a continuous improvement kind of problem. I think that there is a much more fundamental trick that works here. So the first uh, observation is that to some degree, all current methods, and there are plenty, because whenever you reach a, a ceiling uh, in a certain domain, you start up uh, trying of, uh, a lot of different ways <laughs> of doing things. But none of these actually came really beyond the ceiling, uh, that fictional ceiling. And so I said, okay, what other reference do we have? Uh, there is only one reference implementation for that uh, algorithm, let me call it like this, uh, which is actually the human brain. So anything mm -hmm. that basically explains uh, how the human brain works should give a good hint on what we should do uh, in terms of language. And then the first uh, impression is that 
there is enormous amounts of explanations or uh, concepts of what certain parts of the brain are doing under certain conditions. But uh, if you're not a, a super specialist yourself, it's just so much light that you can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so to me, the key moment was actually to first uh, listen to Jeff's uh, explanation of his approach. And the beauty of his approach is it gives you a conceptually manageable uh, system that allows you to zoom in and out depending on how well you do know the details, but you can zoom in and out in the model and it stays sound. And that was uh, extremely impressive to me because it allowed me to find, uh, let's say, the right level of resolution that I can cover. And it allowed me to play through a certain number of things. And I just realized, okay, there are many of the uh, problems that I know from statistical modeling of language uh, that could roughly be uh, sort of mapped to that kind of structure that uh, Jeff describes. There was one key moment when I started studying Jeff's materials, I was still not clear on what does that really mean. I mean, it was just this gut feeling, if you want, that, okay, uh, that's the direction I should for some time follow to see if something uh, pops up. Uh, and then there was this moment when uh, Jeff uh, started to talk about uh, sparse distributed representations and how key they are uh, yeah. to allow that whole simple, on the quotes, way of explaining uh, the computation of information. And he said that every information seems to be encoded in such a sparse distributed representation, which we can detail out uh, 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 shortly. But yep. that was the moment when... I had a shift of understanding and I realized that it's not so important uh, to look at the algorithm first, uh, it's first important to look at the representation. And that sort of change of perspective uh, changed everything and from that all the, the, the initials for um, our current uh, approach uh, started. I feel like I've heard you mention that uh, you had this sort of aha moment while you were in the shower, is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds uh, picturesque, literally, <laughs> but uh, the key question at that point to me was, how can I make two words that mean similar things look similar? Because you have, when you think of neural networks as being uh, weight machines to some degree, uh, uh, which they are not in the HDM model, but that's sort of this basic intuition that uh, people have today about uh, about that. And it's easily understandable if I have uh, 100 degrees Celsius or 101 degrees Celsius, uh, they are numerically close and they are also similar in how they behave. So there right. you have a sort of a natural proximity of similarity. But uh, uh, I don't know the word uh, car and truck, uh, they don't show by any means similarity at the encoding level. Right. So we have to convert this into something that makes sure uh, that a truck looks similar like a car because a truck looks much similar to a car than it does to uh, a tree, for example. Uh, so how do we do this in the first place? And once we know how we do this, uh, how can we automate this? Because I cannot start uh, writing the dictionary about everything uh, in order to have um, this correct uh, representation. And the third aspect to this was the famous uh, semantic grounding. So where does the link uh, between the pointer or the label of something and the actual representation of something, where does that happen and how does that look like? These were yeah. the three starting questions. Yeah, very good. So I was talking to a friend uh, just a few years ago and uh, he had gone from academia to to industry and um, had studied becoming a, a data scientist and had gone to one of these um, kind of boot camps or whatever for uh, becoming a data science scientist where they place you in a job afterwards. And and he was telling me, you know, there's been so much progress on so many facets in data science, but if if natural language processing is still is still lagging, and if you can solve that, mm -hmm. then you're really mm -hmm. onto something. So so this is you know yeah. exciting yeah. work that you're doing here. So uh, I was actually my my daughter was talking to me uh, the other day, and 
well, first she told me how much she loved me and what a what a great dad I am, of course. But uh, then, clearly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then she she literally she said to me like, learning how to read is hard, and and uh, mm-hmm. and I thought, oh yeah, you know, I wish that I remember learning how to read as a as a young kid. And I thought I thought, oh yeah, language is hard. But then mm-hmm. uh, I sort of thought, well, yeah, language is hard, but you can also think of it as you know our easiest solution to communication given mm-hmm. our brain constraints you know given that we mm-hmm. likely mm-hmm. process just about all the information coming in we we likely process it in a similar way and and this is mm-hmm. one of the insights that uh Jeff Hawkins had um that you yeah, know absolutely. there are these repeating motifs across the cortex which is severely yeah. limiting actually <laughs> so yeah, in a way yeah. you can kind of think of um language as maybe the the easiest and dumbest solution for us to communicate with each other. I don't know if you want to, evolutionarily speaking, uh, anyway. I don't I don't know if you want yeah, to. No, I I I actually absolutely agree. I mean, to me, it was uh, an aha effect when uh, I realized, okay, the there was some point in time where evolution came up uh, with a microcircuit. Uh, that had a certain number of characteristics, uh, input and output. And uh, the way how this uh, microcircuit works, um, and it tried it out uh, in the mammalian brain uh, for the first time to basically lead to a situation that this would be one of the most characteristic, if you want, uh, for a mammalian to some degree, uh, to have this neocortex that sits on top of all the uh, older uh, sort of parts of the brain, and the the genius, if you want, is to find a small circuit. So maybe in computer science you could call it a flip flop uh, that does some basic uh, mm. information processing uh, within the realm of digital computing or within the realm of neural computing. And the algorithm was such that you get more processing power by just adding up uh, those modules. And then you just try to develop uh, a body uh, that can sustain uh, as much surface <laughs> as possible in the brain. And then uh, there is this sudden limitation. And it works well because uh, there is this one species uh, that has this uh, super uh, quick sort of growth period. And uh, it works even out uh, that you can get the babies uh, to uh, come uh, to basically give birth very early. Uh, so that the, the brain can even grow uh, uh, for some period after birth. But then there is this limitation, uh, the famous birth canal. So you cannot uh, grow the uh, the head endlessly for obvious reasons. So the only <laughs> remaining way for getting more neural tissue sur- surface in order to increase uh, computation is to basically do what we do today with the processors, taking several processors and linking them up. And that link, uh, in my understanding, is language. Because when I start thinking uh, about a problem I have, I can also borrow the real state of my neighbor's uh, brain tissue uh, for a moment by communicating my state uh, of the brain and having him uh, sort of use his brain with my state to hopefully deliver uh, an aspect to the problem that is helpful for me. And I think that this is the mechanism by which um, the whole social framework as being a, an evolutionary um, advantage really got this, if you want, uh, substrate or its uh, material manifestation in the first place. So uh, I think that, such, that there is yeah. a, di- a direct link on that level. Yeah. It's such a, I mean, language is really such a beautiful thing when you really yeah. zoom out. And we could just talk about that all day, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but so it, we still don't really know. So I, I'm not super up to speed on the current state of uh, language mm-hmm. in neuroscience. But I know we know areas in the brain where language is processed. But mm-hmm. I we still don't know exactly how it's processed. Um, so this is a remaining question. And this is this is what you're essentially working on, even though you're not a, you're not a neuroscientist researcher. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in fact, uh, language as such is in fact, externalization of the actual scene that's happening. And the actual topic is uh, more of uh, a concept 
kind of topic. Yeah? So language is in fact just uh, the Morse code we use uh, to encode a certain brain state. Yeah? That's the reason why we can uh, afford uh, as a uh, human society to have hundreds of languages, if not thousands, and still sort of uh, work very similar and even have uh, uh, more and more similar cultures uh, that shows that we might not share the same externalization. So whenever we sort of get information out of our brain, it depends on where we are and what our culture is. But what we are sending, the payload is the same. Uh, I can uh, speak to uh, someone in Australia and uh, by, for example, pointing at a photo, uh, we could both say, yeah, these are, uh, I don't know, kangaroos. Yeah, and we have a, uh, not the same, but a similar sort of conceptual model uh, of the kangaroos. Uh, and that allows us to exchange information on kangaroos. Yeah? Uh, if our brains uh, would be fully different and a different language would mean a different representation of qualities, then we could never, ever communicate with someone uh, uh, across a language. Yeah? Uh, and this is, by the way, uh, uh, there is uh, quite a, a lot of neuroscience that points in this direction, also indicating that the semantic part, at least, so that the grounding right. of language uses the whole brain. It, there are these uh, quite famous uh, studies at the MIT from uh, Hack et al. and in uh, and Carnegie Mellon from um, lost it, of course. That's okay. <laughs> I give you the pointer shortly, uh, where they made uh, fMRI pictures of uh, humans who got a concept triggered. So they either saw the word uh, mm. cat or they saw uh, the image of a cat or they uh, could hear the sound of a cat. Uh, in the moment uh, when sort of the concept uh, cat appeared, uh, they make a, a photo basically of the brain activity, and they found out that whenever the concept appears, they get photos that uh, match uh, to a very high degree, to even such a high degree that they could train um, an algorithm to learn that correlation and to later on give it an unseen uh, fMRI picture and the system was properly predicting uh, mm. what concept actually triggered it. Yeah? And as if that would not be already scary to some degree, um, <laughs> they could even show that they could train the machine learning uh, of the correlation of the concept with the picture with one individual, and they could still pretty well uh, predict the proper interpretation of another individual. So this seems even to be similar over individuals. So this inner representation. And, and that is basically the uh, mechanism, I think, uh, by which uh, the brain uh, works with information is that it basically makes snapshot situational data. It makes snapshots of experiences that we have. And every snapshot just contains all the information that we get from all the senses. And that's how we learn about the world, but that's exactly the same way as we learn the language. Hmm. So it's based on a sufficient large, but still astonishing small number of examples. We are capable of storing information uh, about the language by the example. And hmm. if you do this, what became then the semantic folding mechanism, namely by training uh, the semantic space as a map and to use it uh, to encode everything that you learn. That's the way how you make this link uh, between reality and the label, namely by uh, snapshotting the overall experience that you had with something that relates to this label. And that uh, is sort of the origin of the uh, distributed uh, representation. Uh, mm -hmm. A cat is just the sum of all my encounters with cats with all senses. Yeah? And because that contains many interactions, if you look at two different individuals, the two averages of a cat uh, become more and more similar. Mm. by default, because you have seen them in all sorts 
of uh, situations and contexts. And uh, after 20 years, you have, I don't know, uh, 250,000 experiences of cats. Uh, <laughs> and just by pure statistic, that is very similar to, uh, in average, of course, to the 250,000 cats that the boy in the neighbor uh, building saw. And that's why we agree on what cats are, because these averages have enough overlap um, between them. Let's, so actually, let's, um, if we can, let's just back up and then, and then we'll really mm -hmm. get into the semantic folding theory. And, and uh, mm -hmm. from now on, let's stop talking about cats, shall we? Why is it always cats? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. We'll, yeah. we'll, we can stick with cats. <laughs> yeah, it, that's a cultural, uh, cultural uh, uh, tradition. <laughs> in, in Vienna as well, or what? Uh, it, this is worldwide, yeah. Oh, I think, gosh. Uh, although my, my example was even worse because uh, 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 Australia and cats is a, is a bad mixture anyway. <laughs> they, are, they are not so much into cats over there because they don't used to have any. Yeah, so. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe we'll, we'll do kangaroos from now on. So, but yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's talk just a, a little bit broadly about natural language processing. So, um, mm -hmm. or NLP, I could say. So mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, the basic goal of NLP is, is to program computers to process natural language data. Yeah. But I've heard you use the term natural language processing, but I've also heard you use the term natural language understanding with respect to mm -hmm. uh, what you do. But it, what can you kind of hash out the difference between uh, natural language understanding uh, and processing? Yeah, so it's a, it's a quite a, a blurry line, um, okay. of course. <laughs> I would say intuitively natural language processing is a much more um, mechanistic procedure. Yeah, mm -hmm. this uh, starts with things like taking uh, some text out of a document and finding out or cutting out uh, every single word. So whenever there is a blank, uh, you collect the word and you look for the next word. So that is sort of one of the basic tasks uh, that you do uh, in terms of parsing a text. Before mm -hmm. you don't parse the text, you cannot do anything because you don't know what the text actually. Uh, looks like. Yeah? Then after parsing it, you might uh, do things like finding out uh, where are the nouns, where are the verbs. Uh, you might want to uh, reduce words uh, from their uh, polymorphism. You know, a, a verb can have many different forms. Uh, a noun can be singular, plural, and so on, and you do stemming. Yeah? Interestingly, these seemingly simple things if you want to do them seriously, uh, they end up pr being pretty hard. So even something simple like sort of cutting out words of a text, uh, you happen to find a word like New York. Uh, you don't want this to be the word new and the word York. Yeah? Right. You want this to be the word New York. Uh, the president of the uh, national committee uh, should be the president of the national committee and so on. Uh, yep. And if you try to do this fully automated, you will just realize that there is a billion of variants out there uh, for what could be parsed and what could be considered and so on. So these parsers, even although they are doing a fundamental and simple thing, they reach a point where there is no simple statistical rule that they can apply, but they have to bring in special information. And that's traditionally, so people try to do this uh, over uh, the 80s and 90s and tried to do this with expert systems by uh, having linguists type in all sorts of uh, metadata and so on. But this was a Sisyphus work. Yeah? I mean, it was never ending. Uh, and so it found, it, it found only very specific solutions that could uh, be implemented like this. Most of the possible solutions uh, were not just, just not um, economic enough uh, to be practically mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. uh, so people then started to use uh, statistical methods, and they started to build uh, statistical language models. So a mathematical creature that for certain parameters uh, behaves uh, like a, a language expert system. And so uh, then they started to build parsers and uh, of all sorts that use those language models to make educated guesses of is the, the, the word fire in this position, is this a verb or is this a noun? 
and that again improved things and then at some point it sort of uh, there was again this ceiling and nobody could come up with a language model that really improved things yeah mm. and that is uh, what is an indicator to me that we are just missing out an essential aspect here or that the whole strategy of doing a mechanistic language modeling will not uh, help us and then uh, in the in the latest years there was this explosion of text so that even the statistical approaches could not be applied uh, oh. in such an easy way uh, to the text anymore so there was this race between how efficient is my algorithm uh, while being of a certain quality and how much data can i process in a second yeah and so we have today uh, situations that if you would say I want to collect all the global tweets about mobile phones, not even Twitter themselves uh, could solve this, yeah? because it's just not it's just not economic doing this. I know that there are, I mean, so deep learning is all the rage right now, and um, mm -hmm. I, I know that there are plenty of deep learning systems using like recurrent neural networks and stuff mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. approach NLP. And what you do is not deep learning. And I'm not sure if it's the right time now to compare, you know, the deep learning approach with what you do without having already mm -hmm. spoken about what you do. But uh, maybe you could um, just talk for a second about maybe why deep learning approaches are insufficient mm -hmm. for NLP. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we can get really get into um, semantic folding theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically the immediate uh, limitation for uh, let me say, commercial purposes, uh, is the fact that uh, the sheer amount of data uh, that you need uh, to train a deep learning system is not always available. And this is a very optimistic view of the thing. I would say that uh, the more interesting a case comes, uh, the less data you have that allows you to train it, yeah? especially in the language domain. Yeah? Because that companies like Google and Facebook, uh, they, can, they, they have an easy life doing deep learning because, first of all, they do that uh, on their own data and they have endless amounts of this data. Yeah? But this is only uh, very, while the companies are very big and impressive and everything, but they only cover a tiny slice of reality. Yeah? I mean, well, and, and half their so data is about issues. cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's uh, that's another thing. So I, I, I'm, of course, not entitled uh, to talk about the relevance of the data, but I'm just <laughs> uh, scientifically talk about the amount of data here. Um, yeah. uh, nevertheless, I mean, if you want uh, to use deep learning to find out uh, about some inside deal uh, communicated via email, and you tell the compliance officer, yeah, if you give me 10,000 of those emails to train, <laughs> I find you every <laughs> inside deal. Yeah? There would be no bank uh, <laughs> having, uh, having uh, 10,000 of these emails that will still uh, be alive. Yeah? So, yeah. There, and there will never be. Yeah? Even if uh, computers become super efficient and uh, there is only one bank, one big bank left, even that big bank will not have... <laughs> enough data to train this. And the problem is that deep learning uh, trains models on the actual payload data. So if uh, you want to filter emails where uh, you need to have special attention for some reason, you have to train the system on, I don't know, thousands and thousands of these emails. And each of the emails for training purposes has to have a marker saying if that is an interesting or non-interesting email. And if you have enough of this, and of course, first of all, you need the emails, and secondly, you have to annotate them, as we say, uh, right. for what they stand. Uh, and only then you can train a classifier that probably, if you have enough data, and if the class that you want to filter out is really a, a useful class, big chances are that you will do a good job. But um, if you now say, I want to have also all emails where people complain about something, you have to start all over. You have to find your 50,000 complaint emails, you have to annotate them again, uh, and you have to train another model. And that's what I, uh, a strategy that I call the uh, billion model universe, uh, <laughs> uh, because this tries to map 100,000 objects and ends up with a billion of models that model <laughs> that represent those 100,000 objects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is simply not efficient. 
And if we have learned something, is that evolution doesn't tolerate anything that is not efficient. This gets immediately eliminated. Yeah, yeah so that was the reason uh, why we said we have to find a different way, and this different way was precisely to find out that the representation was actually the key. And once you got the right representation, the algorithm uh, literally becomes trivial to some degree. Hmm. It has to be trivial because computation-wise, uh, neurons are trivial. So anything that uh, contains uh, cosine and, uh, and integrals and I don't know what is definitely far beyond what a neuron could ever process. Yeah? Right. The, the neuron can, in the end of the day, fire or not fire most of the time. Yeah? Um, <laughs> so the representation has to be able and support this. Well, yeah, so let's um, talk about how, how we get to that representation. So um, you have a, a paper online available um, that describes mm -hmm. and walks through a bunch of, um, you know, all the details and examples uh, of your semantic folding theory. So uh, I had Jeff Hawkins on the show a while back, actually, mm -hmm. and we talked mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, the hierarchical temporal memory uh, that he uh, mm -hmm. has um, developed. But we, we mostly actually talked about his more recent theory uh, about how uh, each cortical column encodes essentially an entire object. But um, anyway, mm -hmm. one of the principles of his approach to how the cortex works, like we already said, is that um, these repeating cortical columns are all performing the same computation on on data mm -hmm. that's coming mm -hmm. in and, and making mm -hmm. predictions. I wonder if you could just talk about what else might be useful background information Mm -hmm. uh, on on HTM hierarchical temporal memory mm -hmm. for us to proceed then with semantic folding theory and if you need to get in the shower to do this that's okay. <laughs> no, I've, I've done this once. This uh, usually uh, uh, should be enough. Um, okay. uh, yeah. So that's precisely the point. So every cortical column stands for an object or for some real world information. Yeah. This could be a uh, uh, let's say the pixel uh, in your retina in a given context. Uh, this can be, I don't know, for a, a certain shape of a nose uh, and so on, uh, depending on where in the hierarchy you are. But what is common to all these co columns is they have a link to something real in the sense that it is data that originates from the senses. There is no other source of data, even if it's data that comes from other regions, if you trace back the initial sort of trigger um, of this region, region jump uh, was definitely somewhere in the census. And this is what I call the special case information that I have for a given moment, basically. And this is also very different from all sorts of statistical representations where one feature is the weight of the neuron branch, uh, 300,058, uh, to the neuron, 8,370. But nobody has a clue what this figure that is stored in there as a weight, how that relates to anything. And that is one of the big problems why you, why you cannot really debug a, a deep learning network. You can just try out playing around with parameters. Uh, but if you happen to have even just uh, 15 parameters, you could easily last the rest of the universe uh, lifetime to actually find the optimum uh, configuration. Yeah? So this is, again, although it might be mathematically correct that at some point uh, the system will converge, but if that is after the next big bang, then that's not valuable or useful uh, information. <laughs> and and uh, especially if what actually you need to do is to uh, flee a sawtooth tiger that is coming after you. You have to have a strategy that allows you to say whatever the answer to my question will be, it needs to be here in, I don't know, 30 milliseconds. Otherwise, it's not right, worth. Right. Yeah? Uh, and uh, in, in Stone Age, if you want, that was a key <laughs> feature of the algorithm. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, there were just nearly everything outside of yourself was dangerous to some degree. Yeah? And how can you do this? Yeah? How can you 
arrange information in that way. And the way how semantic folding is doing this is by having a um, two separate processes. One is a process where the sensorial input is projected onto a map in a way that sensors triggering in the same time uh, start aggregating on the map. They start building uh, clusters. And, and I think that there is a lot of parallel uh, findings that, that we have on, on neuroscience. For example, this uh, famous big pruning uh, could precisely be uh, a mechanism where after uh, an, uh, an inflational uh, link up between the neurons starts by default, which would be a, a pretty simple mechanism that could be something that is triggered by some gene or something. And then only the ones that have, uh, let's say, the lowest, the lowest trigger levels to fire uh, are the ones that remain because they have been used uh, sufficiently enough. Uh, and all the synapses that have not been used. And if a neuron has no useful synapse, then the whole neuron uh, might just get eliminated. Are you talking about pruning as in when we late in our teenage years? The, no, or the, the like two after year, because... the two year, the, the oh. two year old uh, pruning. Yeah, so this I see. is a, yep. a, a literal organic pruning uh, mechanism. And the point is that if you allow the environment to change the morphology of how the feature bits of your sensors are arranged, what happens is that you end up with an arrangement of your sensor bits that somehow capture the semantics of the world plus the semantics of your sensors because mm. that's uh, the the baby doesn't get a lot of information in the beginning from the world because everything is blurry but that's the moment uh, when the basic organic map is drawn yeah because the auricular uh, nerve looks in a certain way uh, in a human and the uh, the the optical nerve uh, looks in a certain way and the system has to be initialized uh, with this topological setup of all these nerve endings. And then it's by exposing the sensors to actual data that there is sort of a refinement of that map until bits that contain similar information because they are uh, triggered in similar moments, they get close together. And it's very obvious for that reason that, for example, the optical nerve creates a close to one-to-one -to -one projection in the first optical layer because by default, a sort of a bitwise organized uh, retina, two bits that are next to each other typically get triggered at the same time with the same color uh, because they come from the same object uh, in the external world. And therefore, that's the reason why the optical uh, system, you can literally map what the person sees. But with the acoustic system that is more sophisticated by splitting up the frequencies and so on, it looks more uh, chaotic if you want, if you look at the first projection uh, layer in the brain. But hmm. still, the, the principle, I think, is the same, that you encode the actual perception based on a topology that stems from all the sum of all the previous experiences. And that adaption of morphology seems to slow down because uh, sometimes you reach your stable semantic understanding of the world and then only the pattern remains interesting. Whereas uh, in, in a younger brain, if the pattern is extraordinary enough, it might still influence the way how you uh, capture information. So to me, this fits uh, quite well uh, with what we experience. And the practical way how we implemented this, and that's where you see why computer science is so nice, is because you can literally always simplify uh, pragmatically everything, is that we take some text and we, t we declare this text to be the reference about a specific language. So if I want to uh, create a system that understands medical records, in reading me medical records, I have to teach the semantic system uh, the language of medicine because mm -hmm. 
all the existing knowledge that we have of the world about medicine is encoded using the language of medicine. So I have to first do the same as I would do with a human. I teach you uh, the language. So you go to school, you go to high school, you go to university. And uh, after a number of years, you understand, let's say, 70% of the typical language that doctors use when they talk to each other. And once you have reached that point, although you might have never seen a medical record, but you will be able to look at it and make some sense out of it. And that is the difference. A deep learning approach would have been to collect 500,000 medical records and to train my model on those. That is, if you want, the big difference. Because with our language model, I can then take, I don't know, diagnostic records, and I can do the same. I can understand them, and I can differentiate them uh, because um, I know the language in which they are formulated. And the the basic unit that your system works on is a word, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. So you you these words get coded as a sparse distributed representation, and maybe you can just talk about what a sparse distributed representation is yeah, in yeah. the context of a word, and then and then we can just kind of walk through the way your your system processes the data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the sparse distributed representation is basically a binary vector, very large in size. So we, for example, work with a vector that has 16,300 something bits behind each other. But this is ridiculously small of what you would expect uh, in the brain. There we probably speak of millions and hundreds of millions or whatever uh, of one uh, representation. And the way it works is that every bit in this representation stands for a fact in the world in the end coming in from the census so it is traceable by default what it means and you have uh, a sparsity which means only a very small number of the possible positions have ones and most of it has zeros and the interesting thing is that there is a mathematical proof uh, saying that these sparse vectors have certain properties. And as it turned out for us, one of the most important properties is that you can aggregate them, which basically means you can add them together. So you can take 10 different uh, strings, each uh, 16,000 bits long, with a small number of ones scattered along this uh, string. And if you now gather, so whenever one of them has a one in a position, you make a one uh, in the target. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that with the resulting representation, you cannot calculate back how the original 10 strings have looked like, but you can calculate the degree in which an arbitrary string could be member. So you can interpret the viability of the match between a string with a given uh, pattern. And mm. uh, interestingly, you can close to endlessly aggregate those sparse uh, representations without actually losing information. What happens in language, for example, is that you get a more and more higher level view on the thing. So if I make, we call the, the sparse distributed representations, we call them fingerprints, semantic fingerprints. Uh, because yeah. it's sort of <laughs> it's easier to pronounce. Yeah. Um, so I can add the semantic fingerprints of a sentence together. I can add uh, the fingerprints of all the words in a paragraph, in a document, even in a book or even in a, in a library. The point is that the representation will be always correct in terms of topics, of, of how important certain topics are but it will be more and more sort of large scale view of the thing. Yeah. And yeah. making a fingerprint of, of a library uh, would allow me to say for a, for an unseen book, how well it fits in this kind of library. Mm. Um, and, and what I now want uh, to explain is uh, how we actually uh, sort of compute uh, the fingerprints. So, yeah, please. so as I said, we, we train uh, from reference material. So, uh, in order to stick with the, our virtual medical student, 
let's say, uh, we bring together all the textbooks and reference books that a human would need to become, let's say, a medical doctor. Yeah? So you might end up, let's say, with some hundred books that you have to uh, read and uh, learn as a human. Uh, and I extract the text from there. And then I slice the text down to sentence level. And with every sentence, I also remember the paragraph it mm. was in. I remember the last title, the super title, and even the book title, if you want. That Because all of those titles are with textbooks, typically, and with reference materials. They are structured in a way to give you the, if you want, ontology reference to this to this specific concept that is captured in a specific sentence, okay? And you now take all these words that you have in this hierarchy of titles plus the sentence in the end, and that becomes a special case experience of a basic unit of language. So the basic unit that has meaning, that can have meaning is a word. And of course, there, it's again, it's a blurry line, but in general, uh, a word is, let me say, uh, sort of the smallest entity that uh, means something. Yeah? yeah. And then those words are taken to formulate specific uh, claims or information units. And that's the reason uh, why we have structure in the language, why we have sentences, why we have paragraphs and so on. And that's, in fact, the implicit or the explicit representation of the implicit order that that information has in the author's brain. And when he wants someone else to properly understand this, he has, of course, not only to carry the information as such, but also, to some degree, the structure. And that's why we uh, read out the reference information in that way. So let's say we started with 100 books, and we now have a million of these uh, small snippets containing the words of it. Mm -hmm. And now we simulate what in the, in the biological brain happens by uh, sort of moving the, the order of the sensory bits around. In, in biology, this might happen uh, either while the, while the nerve grows or uh, while the nerve operates uh, in, in, in early stages. Is that we arrange the snippets and then we use machine learning and that's the only actual machine learning step that is in uh, semantic folding is to arrange the snippets on a given space. So we take, we define the space uh, as being a metric space of uh, 128 times 128, could be anything I, else. Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask why, so, so that's, the semantic fingerprint is a little over 16,000 binary units, and that is yeah. 128 by 128. So exactly, um, yeah. So I'm just curious how that how you settled on that number. You know, uh, first of all, the obvious is uh, it should be a, uh, a power of two to be uh, efficiently implementable, and uh, the specific size. So why isn't it uh, 64 times 64 versus why isn't it uh, 256 times 256? It's purely the ratio of how useful is the uh. given resolution, how well can I separate two things that are separate, while making sure that things that are similar still overlap. So it's basically like when you have a light microscope, uh, you have to know what lenses you use to know what color the light has to be that goes through it. If you send the wrong spectrum of the light to the light microscope, you might see a blurry uh, picture. Uh, so you have to match those two parameters. Uh, and here uh, in the semantics, uh, it's also, I have to make sure that I can discriminate two sentences in the sense of, uh, yes, they are both diagnosis sentences of a medical record, but this is one diagnosis and that is another. And if I have too low semantic resolution, I could just say that both are diagnosis, but I cannot say if they are similar or not that as diagnosis. And we have, I have to say, we have done this basically by trial and error 
And that has proven to be sort of the zero degree Celsius, if you want, uh, yeah, the region. Sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with um, a theory about, um, you know, how the brain might encode the information. It's, it's more of a computational so what, issue. Yeah, this is a computational issue. The fact that this is a two dimensional extent, of course, has to do with the fact that the brain or the neocortex is a two dimensional structure and something that feeds into a two dimensional structure transmitting a topology has to be two dimensional at least. Yeah. Right. So it could be three dimensional, but that again would be, uh, you wouldn't become better. Things would just get more complicated to compute. So again, efficiency is king. Uh, that is the smallest dimensionality where you can work with a two dimensional pattern of computer inputs that you have at the at the neocortex level. Yeah. yeah. Well sorry sorry I interrupted you there. So you you have the text, you break it up into these snippets, and then the snippets get broken down. I arrange in... the snippets uh, I yep. arrange the snippets on my uh, space of 128, so 16,000 positions, mm -hmm. in a way that snippets containing similar words stay proportionally close to each other, and snippets with fewer similar words stay proportionally far apart. And, and that's the machine learning our, step, right? Exactly, because that's yep. an optimization thing. Yep. Yeah, you just yep. uh, you uh, you correct the error a little, you recompute it, you correct the error a little until the improvement is so small that you say, okay, that's good enough for my purpose. Got it. Uh, practically, uh, it takes us about two hours to to compute that uh, mm. mapping uh, thing. Mm. Uh, so it's a, a reasonable a reasonable amount of time, not uh, five days, because that could already change uh, how you do real world stuff uh, if every time you need to compute this uh, takes five days you have uh, other problems yeah 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 so once we have uh, computed that map that distribution which is a total projection of the set of examples that you chose for uh, reference so that's uh, again the same as for humans depending on uh, who the teachers are and what uh, you write, what you have written into the school books, that's what the kid uh, will internalize. Yeah. So if it's medicine, it will be the medicine understanding. If it's uh, law text, it will be legal understanding and so on. This even is true for different languages. So you can do this in German, French, English. We have done it uh, for Chinese, Arabic, Russian. Uh, so even if the the whole writing logic is different, uh, this still works. In fact, what the only thing that you need is the notion of there is a grammar behind uh, the use of the word string, uh -huh. uh, even if I don't know the grammar. That just needs to be a grammar, which means the strings depend on each other. So in, in Chinese, you have uh, the whole a word basically or, or sign that depends on the other signs in uh, English it's this word depends on all the other words in the sentence because there is a grammar structure that says how to build sentences and that interdependence so that every word depends of all the other words in all ways uh, in the way how uh, the declination works in the way how the polymorphism works uh, in the way how you make it plural all of that is influenced by all the other parts of the same language. And this is, per definition, a semantic universe. Yeah? And if I now take a smart set of examples, and our schooling of kids is basically exposing them to the world, but making a, a simulation that is much smarter, that allows them in quite short time understand stuff that it took us maybe a thousand years uh, to understand. So mm. there is this sort of improvement of this uh, teaching. And the same strategy is basically when we have what we typically call the subject matter experts who choose the reference material for their domain. And I keep telling them, choose the books that you would want a new employee to read first. Yeah? Mm. Those are the books that are key to capturing the essence of your domain.
and what we do as a next step. This is sort of uh, the first step was the building of the semantic map. And the second step is make, that we make a word list. So we make a long list of all the words that occur in my reference. And I take every word only once. So let's say I end up with 100,000 distinct words. And for each word, I can now say in what snippets is this word appearing. And because I have a coordinate position associated with each snippet due to the map, I have now the set of all snippets that contain the word uh, give me this distributed pattern of bits that go on. Yeah? And this is, I should, a, I should, sorry, I should say that, you know, it's, it's hard in an audio podcast, yeah, but yeah. you can visualize and, and you show this in talks and in your papers that, you know, this 128 yeah. by 128 square pattern where a word is then represented, um, if it appears in 12 snippets, you flip those 12 bits on, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. And then so, yeah. so it gives this colored pattern of what a word, yeah. how a word is represented in this space. So exactly and what is characteristic is that this bit pattern is very sparse. So the, ma the vast majority is white. And only yeah. uh, in our case, we take about 2% as the upper limit uh, is used. And the incredible thing is, although we have this tiny little space of 16,000 uh, positions, we can encode enormous amounts of information without needing more space. Hmm. And that is, uh, from a biological point of view, exactly what we need. Because the one thing that we can be sure of is that we cannot grow the brain. So if uh, we want to have memory space for... Uh, 50, 60, 80 years of life, there is a lot of information uh, to <laughs> store. So the representation has to be done in a way that it stays relevant. So uh, recent information has to be sort of more important to some degree as uh, ancient information. But we still have to sort of feel the ancient information because otherwise our predictions uh, will be bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that is a big problem, yeah. Because we, in, in computer science, when you run out of memory, uh, you go and buy new chips or you put right. a new computer next to it or whatever, yeah. But uh, that's not the way nature could do this, yeah. Right. So right. The, I, I find it quite impressive how the biological constraints sort of pointed into a completely different uh, way of doing things. So. By introducing a pattern, a topology, and we find a lot of topologies uh, in the neocortex, the whole concept of having regions uh, of stuff is in the end uh, topological. Yeah? So uh, topology seems to be one of the principles to the neocortex, I, I would even say. In my own research, even, uh, I recorded neurons in a brain region called the frontal eye field that's um, partly responsible for making our eyes move, making eye movements. And, and mm -hmm. in, in this mm -hmm. region, just, you know, another topology, as you move your electrode down through the region uh, across the cortex, mm -hmm. essentially, you can stimulate, micro stimulate it and induce eye movements. And, you know, there yeah. is a topology because, you know, as you go down yeah. a little yeah. bit further, the eye movement changes direction smoothly and changes, yeah. changes, yeah. changes yeah. direction and changes yeah the distance so so yeah there are these topologies all over the place um, and and so what you're yeah. talking about then is a semantic topology essentially yeah to be honest uh, i think that language is just a nicely interpretable set of uh, or aspect uh, but i think uh, one thing that is uh, key to jeff's theory is that every part of the neocortex does fundamentally the same thing so if that is the way how we assimilate and handle language. Basically, everything else uh, is supposed to work in a similar way, yeah? because there is precisely not a module A that does this kind of uh, computation and a module B that does some other kind of computation. Mm -hmm. uh, they have slight differences, but I've been told that uh, it's even hard uh, to discriminate the neocortex of a mouse versus the one of a, of a human. Uh, so mm -hmm. similar they are. Humans yeah. is a little bit larger, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, so you have these semantic fingerprints is what you end up with. You know, each word has a semantic mm -hmm. fingerprint. And exactly. then as you say, because they're so sparsely populated, you can then do all sorts of computations with other words to form sentences, as you were talking about earlier. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, 
and your main the main computation that you do on these is a similarity computation. I don't know if you want to uh, discuss that a yeah. little bit. Uh, yeah, so there are two things. There is one thing is that I can literally apply Boolean operators right. to these fingerprint representations, and the Boolean operators on the bit directly correspond to a semantic function in the set in the in the sense of of the representation so if i take the fingerprint of jaguar so i assume that i have learned i forgot to say this i assume that i have learned the language space with uh, wikipedia which is some sort of uh, college student knows everything sort of reality and you now convert uh, the word jaguar into a fingerprint and you convert the word porsche into a fingerprint the first thing you will see is that they are, at least uh, in certain regions, very similar, precisely in the region where the bits, uh, the bits stand in context that have to do to cars, for example, or even to sport right. cars, let's say. So if you take now the Jaguar fingerprint and you subtract all the bits that are in common between Porsche and Jaguar, yeah, so the overlap between Porsche and Jaguar, and you take away wherever they actually overlap, what you get is a fingerprint where the closest word to it is the word tiger. And it is the word tiger because a Jaguar could be either a car or it could be a, a big cat. If you take away every hint that points to a big car, what remains is a fingerprint that looks similar like the fingerprint of the word tiger. That is the, this mechanism that, for example, um, uh, an example I usually give is the word organ, that in English is ambiguous again. And if I use it in the sentence, organs and pianos are musical instruments, the region about organ being a biological structure will not be strengthened when I add them up by any other word because the word uh, musical and piano, they are all not ambiguous with that part. Only right. the word organ has this ambiguity. So if I do my aggregation, and then of course I have to uh, sparsify the results back to the 2%, all the bits relating uh, to organ like liver and lung uh, will be eliminated because they haven't been strong enough in the aggregation. And what happens here is basically with probably the computationally most simple mechanism by uh, sort of anding and oring um, together binary structures, I can computationally disambiguate the word organ because no human will ever have a problem in uh, right away perfectly understanding what the sentence means without even thinking on liver or uh, lung. And this used to be in the, in the traditional NLP space this used to be uh, one of the uh, big uh, holy problems on how to computationally, uh, without using lookup, of course, in a, in a mm -hmm. dictionary, mm -hmm. uh, how could I ever uh, computationally disambiguate anything? On the other hand, so why this is so effortless for humans, I think becomes uh, perfectly clear if you see that the sheer aggregation, so the sheer uh, representation of a sentence already implicitly disambiguate all the contained words without needing any extra computation. So again, it's all about efficiency. And yeah. why, why would there be ambiguity in the first place? Of course, in order to allow you to reuse the same word for several things. Because it's more efficient to only need uh, 10,000 words uh, mm. as an adult part of the society than needing I don't know, uh, a million words uh, in all the flavors. Yeah. And in order to sort of be memory efficient, and by, again, using this very little space of 128 times 128, you can even pack multiple meanings per word without losing anything. Mm. If you make the math of, so 2% that we typically use for a fingerprint are about 320 or so bits that we use at a given point, out of the 16,300, if you make the math on in how many ways can I select uh, 300 out of 16,000 bits, 
you get it's a factorial number, so you end up with uh, atoms in the known universe or something right. of that right. uh, order. Yeah, I mean probably well, I exaggerate, but it's a huge combinatorial space just on this little tiny patch of sixteen thousand bits. Yeah, and yeah, and the the computations that you do, just the simple subtraction, addition, and uh, comparison, it's so beautiful and clean. I, you know, I, yeah. Well, it's something you, a neuron can actually make. Yeah. Right, right, right. I, I don't know how you actually came to the semantic fingerprint, like, but I, I'm I'm imagining a time where you where you realized what you had, and then I'm wondering what that felt like to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I uh, read the first time about neural networks when I was uh, in school uh, uh -huh. in the in the late '90s, and. I don't know. I was I I was fascinated by having a, a programmable process find out something. I mean, this whole I mean that a computer could add two numbers or multiply two numbers. This was trivial uh, even then. But to get something complex where you just do a, a a little bit of sampling and then the system would find out something that you could never find out because it's too complicated. That was fascinating me. But mm. one of the first stopping point I saw is precisely language. So mm. if, I, and then I had a very uh, naive approach to this, but if you would encode characters uh, into ASCII codes and you would feed your ASCII codes uh, into a neural network, it would take forever yeah. uh, to yeah. even, even understand what Peter Pan is. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really, um, uh, so I said, okay, this is impossible. Uh, a human, kid he hears a word one time maybe two times and then you hear him already using this word properly yeah so right, that right. cannot be the right way and so for me already then was the question okay all of that is nice but how do i feed text into this i mean numbers is obvious yeah if two numbers are close they tend to represent something uh, that relates or that is similar so but how is an a similar to a b yeah what is and then i did not know um about uh, things like representation interestingly in retrospective when searching for an answer myself i found myself in papers of the 80s and the early 90s and those were more philosophical ideas about things like uh, data representation and so on uh, which i found extremely useful i mean there is this a uh, book from Douglas Hofstetter that talks about the whole thinking process is just making analogies be between things. Yeah, and it's very sound how he explains this. Also, uh, when he says things like uh, the word "cat" again is not in reality, it's not a word, but it's a label of a class. It's, mm. it's the class of all experiences that are sort of catty. Yeah, that becomes the word "cat." Uh, and and he he basically does a pure semantic explanation of it, uh, and I wonder uh, what he would say about our way of representing mm. of capturing this. Yeah. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe one day <laughs> I I manage uh, to have a conversation with him on that. But I think oh. it it beautifully matches this whole conceptual framework he built, where thinking is a computation with uh, analogies, and oh, okay. interestingly. Yeah. You can explain a lot of uh, human capabilities and and particularities also that are founded basically on this analogy making uh, approach. Yeah. I'll have to have them on the show and 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 uh, <laughs> maybe I can uh, have you absolutely. both on at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> I mean well, that would be an honor. <laughs> okay, so I mean you you run a business, right? So we, we've been talking about yeah. all the the technology and how cool mm -hmm. it is, but what do you use this yeah. stuff for? Yeah, so it's a very uh, basic functionality. So by nature of things, you can apply it to many different things, which is a uh, is uh, fantastic, but it's a pain also because <laughs> it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, if you have a, a Swiss knife in your pocket, uh, you have this tendency of taking care of every problem that crosses your uh, your way. Yeah, uh, because yeah, I can do this and I can do that, and uh, so it it at some point it actually needs a, a lot of discipline in kind of keeping a business uh, focus. The point that I would make in general is 
our strength is not even that, how would you say, our results would be sort of have a higher precision or so. I mean, all this machine learning in, in, induced uh, a lot of uh, discussions about uh, precisions and if people uh, know it even a bit better, they might even talk about recall and things like that. But in my experience, you create business value if you are more efficient. And that is really the same parameter uh, that uh, evolution uses, basically. Mm. Yeah? So we have won a number of competitions, not necessarily because we had a 0.1% higher precision, but because we could demonstrate maybe in three weeks that we could reasonably well address and maybe indicate the solution of a problem where others uh, have not even started training the models properly. Yeah? And this turns out to be the key factor because from my perspective, and I meet a lot of uh, large enterprises in, in Europe, in the US, they all have I mean, I wouldn't call it, but I should, trivial problems to some degree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. problems like I'm getting uh, 500,000 emails a day and I know that 60% of them don't need to be addressed, but I cannot filter them out. So a lot of people have to read these emails every day to make sure that we don't <laughs> miss anything important. Yeah? Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you, have, you have companies out there talking about self-driving cars of, I don't know, uh, automated uh, DNA insertion uh, in uh, cells, uh, and I don't know what, but we have not yet made a system that is capable <laughs> of doing what a 10-year-old uh, probably could do. And again, not because there are not methods of doing this. There are plenty of uh, existing NLP approaches that could help you, but you will simply not be able in a real-world context to build such a system with a reasonable efficiency. So you will, you will not find anyone paying you the money it would cost to implement this properly. Yeah? That, that is the big problem. So how, how's business? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so there, there is the other part being small, I would say even very small and successful is also <laughs> complicated uh, yeah, yeah. if you want. So well, you don't you don't um, need to answer the question uh, if you don't want to. <laughs> Just you know. No, no. It's in fact it's in fact business is good. good. Uh, it took a while um, because uh, well teaches you that selling the first car that runs on water is just a hard sell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you might not think, yeah, but it is a hard sell. And we had we had a certain lucky strikes in the sense that because AI is booming big companies are making efforts in sort of being part of that uh, AI thingy. Yeah? Uh, yeah. So it's much easier, I would say, for a, a small company out of Austria uh, to get the attention of some of the uh, big players than it would have been 10 years ago, where probably uh, we would not have uh, a tenth of, of the number of customers to even talk to, yeah? because yeah. They, wouldn't, they would say, yeah, I have a fax machine. What do you want? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so business is good, but good. Uh, especially if things are moving uh, and moving so fast, you just have to be careful to make the real good business decisions, basically, within this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I should also say that you guys, um, if you go to cortical.io, uh, uh, you guys make available toys to play with to try it out the technology absolutely so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. i'll point people there in the show notes of course and and then you can also see mm -hmm. examples of these mm -hmm. well, you probably think they're beautiful i think they're beautiful these semantic fingerprints right mm -hmm. <laughs> um, i know you've looked yeah, at a lot yeah. of them yeah i mean uh, it, it's fascinating i i remember uh, in the early days uh, some five years ago i happened to to talk once uh, to a uh, an investor and uh, he saw these fingerprints and he said, uh, do your users need to look at this uh, in order to use <laughs> your software? And I said, no, 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 this is just a rendering so that you have some sort of uh, feeling on, on, on what this would be or so. And funny enough, it turns out that uh, one of our um, applications uh, that we created uh, is a search engine, uh, by the way. And it turned out that people love to see 
the fingerprint of your uh, query and the fingerprint of a result that you have found and yeah. to see where do they actually overlap, which is why has this document be actually selected? And it turned out that this fingerprint representation is a super intuitive one, especially as you can move your mouse um, over the dots. And for each dot, uh, you have a pop-up with the local keywords that you have in this area. So you can literally take a magnifying glass and try to figure out why has this document been selected. Yeah? That's, that's uh, so cool. I just realized you could probably teach yourself to read uh, looking at yeah. these fingerprints, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you, like me, uh, stare a lot into this, I think uh, that I have already adapted certain circuits in my brain oh, that God. can uh, sort of uh, in depth, more in depth at least, uh, decipher what the uh, fingerprint represents. Yeah, so it's, this... it's it's really uh, and it shows how how well this matches with the way how the how the brain wants to process. Yeah, so I think that yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I have dreams. So I used to. Uh work at a grocery store and check out groceries. And I, I, to this day, I still have dreams where I'll see like a banana floating across and then the number 11 will show up because bananas, yeah, the yeah. code for bananas was 11. So do you see these fingerprints yeah. in your dreams? <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, and, and it's, not, it's not just as the fingerprint, but I literally sit with a customer talking on a maybe new use case that I haven't thought through yet. And I can literally, by mentally arranging those fingerprints, uh, figure out what would be the right strategy wow. in sort of solving that. And what is so scary is that very often this first naive thought, yeah. So, like like I said before, uh, the Jaguar minus Porsche equals Tiger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this was initially uh, this was sort of a joke. Wouldn't it be funny if you could do this? And then I tried it out with a fingerprint and it worked literally. And that is the fascinating aspect is that you don't need some obscure, complex algebra, basically, that doesn't tell you anything. And you just hope by the end of the computation that you get something useful. Here you can literally try out every single step. You can read it. You can see what would that give if I overlap an example of an animal with an example of a car, I would see, I don't know, 30% of the cars having a strong overlap because the marketing departments of the cars keep making uh, links to some animals between the car and the animal. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and you can sort of verify these kinds of things uh, within seconds uh, if you're interested. Well, it's it's really cool work um, and it's really exciting. And I'll, I'll like I said, I'll point people who want to learn more to uh, your paper, yeah. and um, there's a uh, you give a video lecture online that I can on YouTube that I can point to. Yeah. So, like I said, I had Jeff Hawkins on the show, and he's you know obviously I know you agree with this that he's done some really nice work, um, theoretical mm -hmm. work, um, mm -hmm. but he's a, he's actually a little controversial in the neuroscience community. Mm -hmm. You know, he's really also lauded by a lot of the neuroscience mm -hmm. community, so it's it's not mm -hmm. really that much controversy but i'm wondering if you've had any reactions or you know back and forth with any people in the neuroscience community about what they think to about your approach and and just the ai community as well like mm -hmm. how how people are reacting to your work here uh yeah i mean uh, i have not that much uh, contact uh, to the real uh, neuro community i uh, yeah. from time to time uh, uh like to join some uh, conferences, but I can say that uh, the effect that Jeff sees in the neuroscience community, uh, I do see that in the machine learning slash AI community. Really? Uh, is that there is always a, a majority, and this majority, if that majority not happens not to have the sort of uh, uh, best approach, uh, it's incredibly sort of hard to keep up with the world that basically doesn't want to be changed. It's, it's, it's literally as you have to demonstrate a certain amount of persistence until the world decides to sort of give you a chance. Yeah? <laughs> and, um, uh, this is a, a very interesting phenomenon uh, yeah. because it makes sense. It, it also makes sense because 
you don't want to have a captain who with every wave uh, uh, rushes in one extreme uh, <laughs> uh, the direction. I mean, <laughs> everybody will get seasick. Uh, so uh, I perfectly understand that there needs uh, to be a fundamental conservatism in order to allow this whole incremental um, improvement. But if you see this from the personal perspective on what it takes uh, and how much you need to do uh, sort of uh, endless uh, uh, repetitions of what you uh, what you say you have to allow enough sort of discussions with people who are, who are who have a different uh, opinion yeah so i can really uh, relate and i i think that uh, jeff had uh, some of these experiences also in 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 his domain and that's just what it takes to do some structural changes. I think this is characteristic to more structural changes. Yeah, so I had um, Sam Gershman, his uh, advice to to people, you know, getting started in their careers was that you have to be willing to swim upstream and go against the grain and keep your head down. And mm-hmm. and even though the majority, right, maybe doesn't agree mm-hmm. with you, you, mm-hmm. you have to forge ahead. So I, I think that this is mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. lesson that you're... Um, yeah, communicating. Yeah. What is a bit, uh, uh, you wouldn't think this in the beginning, at least I didn't, you actually have to expose yourself because although it costs energy to constantly argue and come up with arguments, but that is in the end the best way of refining the structural change that you might have discovered. I mean, the way how I looked at semantic fingerprints uh, four years ago Today, I look back and think, my God, was I naive. Yeah? Um, and <laughs> yeah. by, by exposing or allowing a certain degree of sustainable discussion, it also matured myself. So it helped me uh, thinking and refining uh, things and also abolishing certain aspects. I mean, for example, uh, in the beginning, I thought that we might want now to apply a lot of the visual uh, uh, computation that... so. There are a lot of algorithms uh, working with images and so on. And my first intuition was, ah, we can use all of these uh, different visual filters and stuff until I find out they are not applicable. Uh, uh, You really want to stick with Boolean operators. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it has always two sides. Well, yeah. I mean, in my own experience, of course, you know, I, I like to use coding as an example because, you know, you're starting to learn how to code. Um, like computers, you know, in, in a whatever language. And then, you know, you code for about a year and then you look back and think, oh man, I'm, I was awful, but now I'm good. And then the next year <laughs> yeah. you look back and think, oh, I was awful, but now I'm good. And it never ends. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, do you I think, can perfectly yeah. relate to this. Do you think that um, that deep learning, you know, which is all the rage right now, do you think that it's overblown? Um, yes and no. Uh, I think that it was good to have something like deep learning because it allowed uh, to, for example, give data its right. I mean, uh, 15 years ago, nobody was talking or philosophing about data. Everybody mm. was talking about processing. Yeah. So this mm. whole aspect that uh, processing also has a lot to do with data. Yeah? The, the whole fact that there is now a job description like data scientists data scientist in the 80s would have been someone who types in some uh, paper records or so that would have been a data scientist. So I do think that there is is a social reason, a good social reason why this is there. On the other hand, uh, you have especially the more advanced uh, people in the domain, but I hear more and more uh, criticisms or descriptions of limitations of the approach. Uh, which I think is good also because it's not only good to learn of a problem, but it's also to start a a more sort of a continuous process. On the other hand, I don't expect deep learning to ever solve some of the real problems. So, I mean, it might sound extreme, but I don't think that current deep learning will be the method for getting self-driving cars. Ah. It will uh, be good for getting uh, very, very intelligent, smart cars that know much earlier than I do that there is an object or a person uh, approaching. All of that, I believe. I think we are. We could, if we wanted, we could already do this today. We might have a, a computational issue that we uh, cannot uh, create this cheap enough. 
but this is just a, a matter of time. But to literally yeah. have a car to decide uh, how to move from point A to point B, uh, I think uh, that we need to find a, a different approach. Yeah? Mm. Uh, and my belief is that probably the most efficient will be the way uh, how uh, evolution uh, taught the mouse to do this. Mm. In fact, uh, we don't we don't even need human intelligence to drive a car. A proper mouse brain, I'm sure, uh, would give a pretty good driver. <laughs> uh, in the end, yeah? yeah, yeah, that's that's funny to <laughs> but, imagine. Uh, yeah, but it's damn hard to to create something that uh, is equivalent to a mouse. Yeah. So uh, just to 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 give a um, sort of uh, an outlook there. If you consider all of these uh, IoT stuff, so in the end, you know, this driving a car automatically means that you have to uh, work with uh, sensor data and that has to be in a model and that model has to tell uh, how you use the steering wheel and, uh, and the gas and things like that. And although we have this ambition, there is not even a standard way of creating the representation of the status of a car. I mean, it could well be that I missed something, but uh, when you ask the operating system uh, of a car today, what is your status, you get probably 500 pages of uh, floating point values of all right. sorts of sensors. But that's not a status. Yeah? And if you ask uh, biologically, uh, if you ask a, a biologist or, or someone who has a natural science view on things, they will exactly know what the state, what what's meant by the status is this sort of uh, compound uh, semantic uh, situation that could even have a name, yeah, like uh, driving slowly uphill on a curvy street. That would be a status at uh, 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 in the heat yeah? <laughs> to, to yeah. use an adjective. Yeah, and if you imagine the temperature of your engine, your sensor tells you the temperature is, let's say. Uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah. So what can this mean? This can mean that either uh, you're driving fast in the plane, or you're mm. driving slow uphill, or you're driving in a hot uh, ambient temperature, and you will always get the same measurement, namely 100 degrees Celsius, but it will mean many different cases. Mm. But if you happen to drive downhill in the winter, uh, and the engine has 100 degrees Celsius, then you know that's an anomaly. Something's going wrong. Yeah? And it's again, it's the same measurement. Yeah? So it's not by collecting all the measurements that we are going to understand what's happening to the car. We will understand it if we have a way of capturing the semantic space of the car and using it to interpret any measurement that we do on this car. And uh, we've done uh, experiments and we could demonstrate that you could apply semantic folding to these kinds of sensor data. Um, oh, so I was going to uh, ask you what, it, if you had a, a recommendation for you know, a, a similar type business to Cortical IO that you think would be good to start based on these same principles. Yeah, So that, yeah. that, would, that would be uh, IoT in general. Yeah. Mm. Internet of Things, IoT? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Other things, other things closer to your domain, for example, is you could interpret medical records. With every blood sample, you can get up to 50 uh, or more parameters. And one thing, and if you remember, I said the only thing that's needed for semantic folding to work is a grammar. But you can be mm -hmm. sure that all the parameters that you can read out of a blood sample they relate to each other grammatically because they're coming from the same system, which is the mm -hmm. human body. Uh, mm -hmm. So if one parameter is high, that will influence all other parameters. Even if I don't exactly know how and where, but I can assume that all the parameters sampled at the very same moment for the very same individual will have a deep um, interaction and the, and the link between them. And in the same way, you could... Uh, create a fingerprint of the calcium level in the blood of a patient. And given on the fingerprint, you could possibly say that um, he is very close with his pattern to someone who just had a heart attack, right. uh, or he's very close to someone uh, who does a lot of uh, endurance sport. Yeah? That's what is to be uh, sort of refined. I just want to say that I think 
that this whole semantic folding could be sort of a, a universal concept. That, of course, the way how we see it today uh, is, of course, naive, uh, but it might be something that comes closer to what uh, nature has converged to in order to make sense of the world, because yeah, what we yeah. have our brain for. Yeah. It certainly has that potential. Um, Mm. I, so you, you guys, you guys heard it. He, he just, uh, Francisco just gave multiple ideas that you could apply this to. So go start your own business here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. what is something that you wish you knew starting a sort of AI based neuroscience based startup or a tech startup? What is something mm. that you wish you knew going in, or maybe like a valuable, one of the more valuable lessons that you've learned through the, cause you've been, you've been doing this for what, 20 plus years. In the meantime, yes, it has been a while, yes, yeah. that's correct, yeah, in in several configurations. So I did this uh, uh, more with a service-oriented approach, uh, yeah. but I also did this uh, now with a technology approach. And first of all, there is a big difference. For some reason, I don't know why exactly, but service-oriented uh, products are at least nowadays a much easier sell, for example, to investors and so on. Uh, than a technology because when it comes to technology, uh, first of all, it's much harder to in innovate uh, technology, um, which is already a not easy way to do uh, right. because it's not just doing the little improvement potentially, but it might need some more fundamental um, approach. And today this is mostly done on the, at the level of uh, business models. So there is a lot of creativity in creating new functional bundles and finding new ways of selling them. That's basically, I think, what what carries the uh, internet boom and the, the whole uh, digitization, uh, basically. Uh, but we have still, we are still lacking some quite fundamental uh, components. And uh, one of those uh, is definitely the way how we process data according to the, the in the meantime, already old uh, von Neumann uh, approach. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's interesting to see how hard it is today to think out of the von Neumann box. It reminds me a bit with Darwin's times when he tried to tell people that you can explain a lot by applying the concepts of evolution. But right. there were, of course, a lot of situations that he couldn't answer yet because uh, he has also to study and think through things. But having found a principle that is somehow counterintuitive, and matches nicely to questions that have not that were not touched simply because uh, there was more the creationist approach then it took quite a, a an amount of effort uh, to do this but it also created a lot of space for a whole new generation of science yeah uh, so i think even the physicists in the end had improved their way of researching because someone like darwin uh, came along at some point, yeah? yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, yeah, one one has simply to stick to this guideline of trying to be more efficient. This, this, as as soon as you see that you do something more efficient than it used to be done, you can assume that you have a, a business there. You just uh -huh. need to maybe forge it <laughs> uh, to find yeah. out how you implement it. But before you don't see that you improve efficiency in any any sort of uh, dimension. Usually, uh, it will be uh, hard uh, to run a business on that. Do you uh, do you recommend starting a business? <laughs> uh, absolutely, I, I think uh, it's the most uh, adequate time nowadays uh, to uh -huh. innovate. Uh, it might not be so much uh, the academic uh, world, maybe for certain topics. There might be topics that just need the real reality. I mean. Uh, the scientific reality has always some sort of optimized uh, clean room uh, situation, with the exception of uh, specifically uh, problematic sciences like, uh, I don't know, sociology or to some degree philosophy even, I would say, that have been blurry. But I think that in the future, those might become mm. the, the leading sciences, if you want. Uh, leading, let's say, in a in a commercial under quotes way, or with the commercial impact they have, because once we manage to compute with semantics, then we can approach something like sociology 
in a, in a much more realistic uh, manner. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, just just imagine uh, if you make the proper fingerprints of the message of a politician and you make the fingerprints <laughs> of the opinion of a voter. Uh, uh-huh. You have a completely new way of looking at these things, uh, yeah. not as uh, percentage values, but as differentiated, detailed, partial overlaps and uh, non-overlaps. Uh, I think that there is a whole... Once we master semantics uh, programmatically, we can overcome statistics. Yeah? So statistics is the best tool for us currently yeah. to explain the world and make it useful, but it has this fundamental limitation that it's it's just a model and it's just more or less like reality but with uh, with the semantic folding approach you can compute with the literal data that uh, reality provides yeah and I, i'm pretty sure that this will open up uh, a lot of new perspectives yeah oh, it's exciting what i really meant was um just just because it's uh kind of a it's a scary thing to just go on your own and and start a, a business because businesses fail you know so um, uh, yeah so what <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know well see that's yeah. <laughs> that's the thing is you you have that attitude right but but maybe you're mm-hmm. just that special type of person to to uh, uh, yeah, to forge ahead. yeah. So, i mean uh, and the point is even uh, if it fails uh, it it can sort of bring you forward. Uh, it depends uh, if you have been sincere with yourself in, in doing this try. Yeah? If you have been, then it will improve yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Uh, but this is also a very specific difference, for example, between the US community, let's say, in, 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 in the tech scene and the European. You are not so much allowed to fail, if at all. Uh, in Europe. So you rather oh. uh, chew your product a uh, very long time until it's perfect and then you, you hit the market and you become a star. What happens often, unfortunately, is that people have just moved on and the market where you wanted to offer your uh, product doesn't exist anymore by yeah. the time it takes uh, to actually get there. On the other hand, if you have the strategy of building up uh, 100 businesses to actually have one you burn a lot of money. Yeah? Uh, that's money that o- that also needs to be generated. So both the limits. What I saw to be the rare thing is, so it's not even so much the startup people; it's the investors. They are the sort of the motor for the whole system. Right. And interestingly, so one caveat, if you want, that I would give is: don't expect a, a purely strategic play to happen because uh, strategies uh, uh, are very complicated and uh, especially when involved uh, with money and so on, this becomes a very complicated situation. Uh, So in the beginning, it's mostly a tactical play. So you have to be smart in your day-to-day decisions uh, while keeping uh, the strategic view a little down the road, but still keeping it uh, it in sight. But... uh, uh, that at least that was something that I struggled with is to find uh, the right amount of strategy uh, thinking uh, in this hmm. whole thing. Well, Francisco, this has been, I, I really appreciate you taking uh, so much time and, and sharing so much knowledge with us today. And uh, I, I really think what you're doing is great work. And I just wish you the best of luck moving forward. And, and thanks for being with us today. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Brain Inspired is a production of me. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling two or four dollars per month. Go to patreon.com slash braininspired or go to the website braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help keep this show going without any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stare.